This is part three of the lecture on the Michelson-Morley experiment. In part two of the lecture, I went through the mathematical development of the theory behind the experiment. There is, however, a problem with the experiment, and the problem goes like this. Let's say that you perform the experiment and you see a dark fringe in the center of the interference pattern. How do you know whether or not you are, in fact, truly seeing the motion of the Earth with respect to the ether, or you're just seeing slightly different lengths L associated with the arms of the interferometer? Remember that we're talking here about light. The wavelength of visible light is measured in terms of hundreds of nanometers. That's an extremely small distance. So then therefore, if the distances L of the interferometer arms are slightly different from one another, then the difference in the arrival times then between the two beams would be measurable. So for example, let's say that this arm of the interferometer is longer than this arm of the interferometer. So then therefore, even if the Earth is not moving with respect to the ether, then the light beams go out, hit their respective mirrors, and they don't quite come back together at the source at the same time. So then you would see a dark fringe. So once again, how do you know what you're seeing if you do in fact see a dark fringe? That is, are you truly seeing the motion of the Earth with respect to the ether, or just slightly different L's? Okay, so stating this here, the problem with the experiment is as follows. Okay, let's say that a dark fringe is observed. Okay, how do we know? seeing the motion of the earth with respect to the ether or just slightly different distances L. Well, there's a solution to this problem. The solution to this problem is to rotate the entire experiment through a 90 degree angle. Okay, here's how this solves this problem. So consider the following. Okay, so once again, we have the interferometer drawn in the following way. Here is the source, here's mirror A, here's mirror B. Let's assume that our motion with respect to the ether is like so once again. Okay, for now, let's say that the L's are in fact the same. So let's say it right here is distance L, this here is distance L. Okay, so we do the experiment in this orientation, and as I still have over here written on the far right-hand board, the time T sub B for that of the parallel arm is a little bit greater than that of time T sub A for the perpendicular arm. So T sub B is greater than T sub A, and then therefore we would see a dark fringe as described in the center of the interference pattern. Okay, now let's say that we rotate the apparatus through a 45 degree angle. All right, so then therefore, if we rotate through a 45 degree angle, then the situation becomes symmetrical. For example, once again, right here is the source. Here's mirror A, here's mirror B. Okay, without plowing through all the necessary Galilean relativity here, what we would find very simply is that now the two times would be equal to each other, obviously from the symmetry of the situation. So in this case, T sub A would equal T sub B, and then therefore, instead of seeing a dark fringe in the center of the interference pattern, we would see instead a bright fringe. Okay, and then lastly, now we rotate through a full 90 degrees. When we rotate through a full 90 degrees, then basically the identities, if you will, of the arms of the interferometer switch. So now mirror A, for example, Here's mirror A, that's now the parallel arm, and then right here is mirror B, that's the perpendicular arm. Once again, the time for the parallel arm is greater than the time for the perpendicular arm. So then, it's, therefore, instead of seeing a bright fringe in the center of the interference pattern, 
we would once again say, see a dark fringe. Okay, so then therefore, if you do rotate the apparatus through a 90 degree angle, you would then see a shift, if you will, in the interference pattern. This shift in the interference pattern could only be due to the fact that we are moving with respect to the ether. It would have nothing to do with slightly different distances L. Imagine it in the following way in the context of Young's experiment. Let's say that we shift here by one full dark fringe. So then therefore what you would see in terms of Young's experiment is that you would see the individual fringes on the screen and then you rotate the entire experiment through a 90 degree angle and it shifts by one full fringe. The amount of shift that you actually see in the interference pattern when you rotate through a 90 degree angle, that then corresponds to the value of u, the speed of the earth with respect to the ether. So that is then therefore the full experimental design of the Michelson-Morley experiment. Let me now take you through the history of the experiment itself. First of all, Albert Michelson. Albert Michelson graduated from the United States Naval Academy around the time of the Civil War. He earned a PhD in physics, and he very quickly established a reputation for himself as being an expert in experimental physics. As you've discovered over the course of this year, doing experimental physics is somewhat of an art form. Well, Albert Michelson was basically a virtuoso at doing experimental physics. That's typically how he's described. Later on, he actually became the first American to win the Nobel Prize in the early portion of the 20th century. After he completed his PhD at the United States Naval Academy, he took what is called a postdoc position at a university in Germany, specifically in Potsdam. And while he was in Germany, he designed the experiment itself and he hired a German optical firm to build an interferometer for him. He then conducted the experiment. And what he discovered very rapidly is that his results were inconclusive. Basically, the interferometer itself was not sensitive enough. What he discovered is that the mere act of him being in the laboratory while he rotated the instrument through a 90 degree angle was enough to throw off his measurements. The reason for that is because as he would walk through the laboratory, the vibrations of his footsteps, for example, would ultimately ruin the measurement itself. So basically his first attempts at doing the experiment were inconclusive for this reason. He then completed his postdoc position in Germany and he came back to the United States. When he came back to the United States, he took a position at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And then he started to seek a different method, if you will, or a different way of increasing the sensitivity of the interferometer and then therefore improve upon the experiment. He enlisted the aid of a chemist friend of his, a chemist who was present there at the university, and this man's name was Edward Morley. As they then searched for ways to, to, to increase the sensitivity of their interferometer, they discovered that you will be able to do so by doing a couple of things. Number one, you want to make the distances L as large as possible. The way that they did this was they actually used multiple mirrors then on the apparatus itself to reflect the light back and forth several times. And then to stabilize the interferometer, in other words, make it sensitive and so it wouldn't be affected by the vibrations of their footsteps inside the laboratory, what they actually did was they took the entire interferometer, they then placed it onto this enormous slab of sandstone, and then they rotated the thing through a 90 degree angle while it was actually floating on a pool of mercury. I've posted a picture of the actual experimental setup from 1887 in today's folder. I invite you now to take a look at that. Okay, now that is essentially the full design of the experiment. What did they actually expect to see? In other words, how much shift in the interference pattern should they expect to occur? Let me take you through that. Okay, I need to do some erasing here in order to do so. Okay, I'm going to keep this portion, however, of the diagram from earlier, and now let's go ahead and label the links L here as different values. So for the perpendicular arm here for mirror A initially, we're going to call this L1, and then here for the parallel arm, we're going to go ahead and call this L2. Okay, now let's go ahead and write down those expressions for this orientation. First of all, the perpendicular arm with length L1. That's the one with the radical sign in the denominator. 
like so. Okay, and then the time t sub b then for the parallel arm, that's with length L2, and that's without the radical sign in the denominator. Like so. And then, as we indicated earlier, there's a difference here in these arrival times. We're going to call this delta t. So it's the time for the parallel arm, this expression here, minus the time for the perpendicular arm, this expression here. Okay, and then they rotate the thing through the 90 degree angle. When they do, remember that the arms of the interferometer basically switch identities. So then therefore on this diagram, now for the parallel arm, length L1, L1, there we go. And now for the perpendicular arm, that's the length L2. So now let me go ahead and write the equations here for the 90 degree rotation. And as we'll see, they're not quite the same thing as these guys here. Okay, so first of all, the perpendicular arm. The perpendicular arm is mirror B with length L2. And the perpendicular arm equation is the one with the radical sign underneath. So now T sub B in this case is going to be the following. Once again, this is the perpendicular arm. And now the parallel arm is for mirror A, and that's with the length L1. That's without the radical sign in the denominator. And then I'll go ahead and write down the difference in the arrival times here. I'm going to call this delta T prime. And it's the parallel arm expression. minus then the perpendicular arm expression. Like so. So take a look at these two messy delta T equations. This guy over here, and then this guy over here. Notice that they're not quite the same thing because the links L1 and L2 have basically switched identities from perpendicular to parallel and vice versa when we rotate through a 90 degree angle. The difference between these two values corresponds to the amount of shift that occurs in the interference pattern. Shift in the interference pattern. Okay, so now what did they actually expect to see in the course of doing their experiment? Okay, well, we've got some numbers. First of all, we have the speed of light C. Speed of light C is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Albert Michelson himself is actually one of the people around the time of the Civil War who made one of the first very accurate measurements of the speed of light. It's one of the early experiments that he is well known for. So the speed of light at this point was well established as a measurement. Okay, and then we have L1 and L2. As I said, they tried to make L1 and L2 as big as possible by using multiple mirrors with their actual interferometer. If you actually take the two values and add them together, then you end up with about 22 meters. So it was a considerable distance that they used here for L1 and L2 added up. Okay, and then what about you? What might the speed of the Earth be with respect to the ether? Well, they made the following assumption. They thought that it might be comparable to the orbital speed of the Earth as it orbited the sun. The orbital speed of the Earth with respect to the sun is 30 kilometers per second. That's three times 10 to the fourth meters per second. Let's make that assumption. Let's assume that the speed of the Earth, U, relative to the ether is about the same number. So let's assume that U is comparable to the Earth's orbital speed. Okay, that orbital speed u is 30 kilometers per second, and that's 3 times 10 to the 4th meters per second. 
Okay, so now based upon that expectation, what then happens when you take those numbers and plug them into these rather horrible equations here? Now let's go ahead and get to those actual measurements, the actual numbers themselves. And in order to do so, let me go ahead and do some erasing here. I don't need these horrible things at this point. And when we do take all of those numbers on the right-hand board, plug them into the expressions that I just erased, and then we find the difference in these delta t's. The difference in these delta t's, I have it written down, is an extremely small number. It's about 7 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Okay, now once again, this number here that I just wrote down corresponds to the amount of shift in the interference pattern. If this number here, for example, was the same as the period of the light that they were using, that would then correspond to a shift of one full fringe. It would be as if you're looking at the interference pattern from Young's experiment. Here's a bright fringe, here's a bright fringe, and then you rotate the thing through a 90 degree angle and it shifts by one full fringe. It would be easily visible to the naked eye. Okay, so then therefore, what about the light that they actually used? Well, they actually used candlelight. Okay, candlelight is brightest in the yellow portion of the Roy G. Biv portion of the visible spectrum, so it's basically yellow. And the period of yellow light, I have this number written down as well, is as follows. The period of yellow light is about 2 times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Like so. Notice that it's a slightly different number than this. Think of this number here as corresponding to one full fringe. So then therefore, the expected amount of shift would be found by doing the following. Take this number here based upon the assumption of U over on the right-hand board, and then divide it by this number here, which corresponds to a shift in the interference pattern of one full fringe. So notice how I'm writing this in the denominator here of this expression. So the seconds then cancel out like so, and when you do the math here, it ends up being about a half a fringe. Which would once again be very easily visible to the naked eye. So a shift of half a fringe would look, say, in terms of Young's experiment, like this. Here's a bright fringe, for example. Here's a bright fringe. You rotate through a 90 degree angle, and it shifts by half a fringe. This should be easily visible to the naked eye. Okay, so now, finally, after all of that, in 1887, they actually do the experiment itself. That's the definitive attempt at the experiment. What actually happened? Okay, let me go ahead and do some erasing here. actually happened after all of that. Well, the result of the experiment is very famous. The result of the experiment has a name. It's called the null result. Nothing happened. No shift was ever observed in the interference pattern. shift was ever observed. They were shocked at this, and when I say they, I don't just mean Michelson and Morley, but I also mean every other experimental physicist at the time who was more or less trying to do the same thing, that is measure the speed of the earth, for example, with respect to the ether. According to physics as it was understood at the time, the experiment should work, and it should work easily, yet we end up with a null result. Nobody could explain this for about 20 years.
Okay, now, however, at the time, as they did the experiment and got their results, at this point, Michelson and Morley, for example, got a little bit desperate. They basically surmised that perhaps the following happened. Let's say, for example, that as the Earth is orbiting the Sun with a speed of 30 kilometers per second with respect to the Sun, boom, right there at that moment, where we're moving in this direction relative to the Sun 30 kilometers per second, well, let's just say that, by coincidence, we were actually at rest with respect to the ether. So then, therefore, let's wait six months. Six months later, we're on the other side of the Sun like so, moving in this direction relative to the Sun at 30 kilometers per second. So then, therefore, relative to the Earth, or relative to the ether, excuse me, our speed should be 60 kilometers per second. And then, therefore, the experiment should easily work. So they literally waited six months and did the experiment again and got the exact same result. The various variables of the experiment were changed. For example, the experiment was done at different times of day. Maybe the rotation of the Earth had something to do with it. It was done in the Southern Hemisphere. It was done in the Northern Hemisphere. It was even done at different elevations above sea level. Every single time that the experiment was performed, it always gave, this, gave the same null result. Once again, this was a huge hole that existed in physics at the time because according to the physics that was understood at the time, the experiment should easily work and nobody could explain why. Not for about 20 years or so. We'll get to that in next time's lectures.